We're going to look at Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. Now, as mentioned before, in this chapter, you notice that there is longevity. There is uh, advancement of civilization and tools, uh, their way of, quote unquote, technology and life. So because of this advancement of civilization, as you might notice throughout our current events, an advancement of civilization, uh, there is apostasy that accompanies with it as well. There is a prideness in men. Uh, humanism is definitely on the rise. During this time, uh, there is no form of idols this time, you'll notice. You'll notice that Genesis chapter 5, uh, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 26, notice how this reads. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men. So that means all the man, all the mankind after Seth began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So you'll notice right here that there are humans during the time of Seth that were realizing that the one true Jehovah God is God himself. There were no idols. If you look at the first mention of idols in your Bible, the first mention of idols in your Bible will be during the time of Laban where he was hiding his images of stone and Rachel hid them. Laban was contemporary during the time of Abraham. So idols will be mentioned during the time of Abraham. And later on, you're going to see why there were so many idols that time. But before then, these idols were actually imitating the gods at Genesis 6. So Genesis 6, there were, notice the wording here, right? It's gods. So they all knew there was the one true God this time, mankind. Now, Genesis chapter 6 says the sons of God. So these miniature gods were roaming about the earth. But people knew that it was one true God. So, if there were no idols that time, and, there were, and people realized there was one true God that time, what's the significance of these beings? The significance of these beings is you go back to Genesis chapter 3, and remember what Satan promised Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 3, and then you read verse 4. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4. That's the key you got to look at. That's why Genesis 6 is significant. Because remember, mankind, they were at the height. Advancement, progress, right? Just like today. Do you hear that term? It is all of humanism. Human progress. We saw this at Genesis chapter 5. There is uh, longevity. There is civilization. There is music. There are tools. Technology, so to speak. Okay, so this perfectly, perfectly, perfectly matches with today. Nothing changed throughout our history, you'll notice. History is so important because it is a repetition and it is actually a prophecy and a prediction, a scientific prediction of where mankind will, trend, will tend to go. That's why it's very important to understand that. So, oh yeah, we don't believe in these idols and stuff like that. Why? Because what we are is we don't realize that there is only one true God. We can be as better. We can be as good. Notice verse 4, Genesis 3 verse 4. The serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know. See, they realize there is one true God. But look what they react to this. Then the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So notice right here, they recognize this, but they don't care. They feel like, well, there's nothing wrong with us being gods as well. 
I mean, let's all be equality here. That's the key. That's what's wrong with equality. That's what's wrong with tolerance today. You know why? Because that's where you're hitting. You're hitting Genesis 3. That's the problem with equality. So it's not just the one true God, we do it his way or you go the highway. No, don't go by just one religion, what he says. Don't go by one Bible, what he says. Condone all these other books that mankind written. Condone all these other beliefs that mankind promote. Promote all these genders and sec uh, sexual fornications and all the colors of the rainbow and the unicorn and the gingerbread man, etc., so that we can all get along together. Why? Because let's all be, have an equal status like him. Because we're so smart as well in our education, in our music, and there's undoubtedly an increase of education when you read Genesis chapter 5 as well. There's no doubt. The knowledge was totally advanced that time. We looked at a few examples, last discipleship. The bodies that they had that time and the minds they had that time is uh, totally, totally beyond our own human capabilities today. Remember, Adam, one quick example was Adam. He was able to name all the animals. Okay, can you name all the animals and remember all those names without a pen and a pencil during that time, without a computer to keep records that time? So there's no doubt you, uh, not only that, you have to create a name on the spot. So undoubtedly their intellectual level was really high that time. So this is where we're at. This makes a lot of sense. All right, let's go to Genesis 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, right? And remember, we all want to be gods. And remember Genesis 5, there was an increase of civilization. When you see, so reflect this in your life. When people grow in a church, when you make a lot more accomplishments in your Christian life and in your ministry, the tendency is pride Amen. kicks in, Amen. and then you invite these devils to work in you. That's good. Okay, learn from your history. But no, you don't learn from your history. <laughs> you humans are so stupid, and you pastors yeah. think that you're hot shots, that you're all stupid, and you think that when you preach one good sermon that you're all that. And you hit the jackpot. And that is wickedness sent from hell. And the great, greatest evidence is you see that online. You see these people who think like, oh, uh, they, they steal, grab stuff from Bible believers. Yeah, and then what happens is when they start to accomplish more and they start to increase with people, yeah. then what happens is they have this godlike mentality, but they cloak it with Bible believing humility, of course. And then what happens? Then they become weirdo, cuckoo, rebels, and they think that they're their own God. Nobody's right except me. See, they created their own God. Preach on that for a while, you bunch of punks out there, man. Criticizing other Bible-believing preachers when you're the one that learned from them. See, you know what? You became a God. Now, I can preach on that, but then we'll never get through our world history. If I preached a sermon in every part of our world history, then we'd be here till the rapture, man. All right. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. See, the increase of people, right? God forbid this will happen to this church. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. All right, so am I reading that right? Yeah, you're reading that right. So these gods saw the daughters of men, that they were very fair. So what did he, they do? They mingled with the women here. Keep reading. So notice the latter part of verse 2, they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, now look at this, my spirit shall not always strive with men. For that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be, see, their longevity, 120 years. Now look at the result. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. When these little gods, these fallen angels, 
mingled with the human women. Notice that the product and the result were giants. So then there were giants in the earth in those days. Not only were there giants, but also there were, notice right there, same became mighty men of all men of renown. So you get superheroes as well. Superheroes and legends. Like the Hercules, right? So then you get these superheroes that come out. And they think that they're all that. There's, that's uh, the sci-fi. That's today's modern cartoon shows of Superman, so to speak. Now, this gets even worse. Keep your hand at Genesis 6. Go to the book of Jude. Jude. It went beyond human. It went to a mingling of animals. So that's where you get... The other remaining Greek mythology stuff. That's where you get your centaurs. That's where you get your mermaids. That's where you get those uh, half-naked men and then goats. You get those, satyrs as well. You also get uh, succubus as well. So is there female monsters as well? Definitely. All right. Let's look at the book of Jude, chapter 1. So that's where we get these female succubus and then these male uh, mutants, so to speak. Jude 1, verse 6. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. Did you read that? So there is such a thing as angels who fallen, fallen angels, left their heavenly state. Why? To live on the earth. That's Genesis 6. They came down on the earth to mingle with the humans. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So notice that God, he judged these fallen angels when they died. So when they died, he put them at a location in hell. But look at this, continuing the context of these fallen angels, even as. Now what does even as mean? That phrase in English, if you do know any English, and if you don't know, you can double check with the dictionary and metaphors. Even as means in similitude of, in like manner, in the same following manner. Okay? Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 7. So notice that Sodom and Gomorrah followed the same manner as the fallen angels. Okay, so that means whatever the fallen angels did, they did the same thing like Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? In what? And the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication. So we know what, what Sodom did with fornication. They did homosexuality. So you betcha these devils, they did something grotesque as well. So there was homosexuality going on. But what else? Keep reading. Notice, and fornication, to fornication, and going after what? Strange flesh. Did you read that? That's bestiality right there. You might say, where'd you get that from? All right. So notice right here that what they did is that they mingled with the beasts and the animals as well. There was bestiality. Where do you get that from? Well, it says strange flesh, right? So because it says strange flesh, look at 1 Corinthians 15. We're only going to look at one verse. I can pour out a lot of other verses, but I'm just going to show you one verse, okay? Okay. When the Bible says flesh, what will it be normally referring to? Well, at Genesis 6, if we go back over there and go to 1 Corinthians 15, right? But let's go back to Genesis 6, all right? Let's double check scripture with scripture. This is what makes things very enlightening. Genesis 6, 3. The Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, correct? Yes, sir. For that he also is what? Flesh. Flesh. Okay, that's not strange. That's normal then. Yeah. So notice, normal, regular flesh is mankind. Then, what is strange flesh? Well, the, just read the word as it says, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of flesh did it say? It said, strange flesh. Is that correct? Okay, what does the word strange mean? Like stranger, right? So flesh is referring to man. When you add strange with that, 
What does strange mean? Well, strange in any dictionary, it means other, another. Why? Because it's not the same person. It's not the normal person you see. That's where we get the idea of stranger, see? In other words, an other. So notice it means other or another. Okay, so what is another type of flesh or other type of flesh if not humans? The only, there's only one answer. Those are animals. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 if you don't believe me. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men. See that? That's one kind. See? That's not another kind. That's not a other kind. One kind of flesh as men. But look at this. Another. See that? Another. Strange flesh, right? Another flesh uh, of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There's your strange flesh. There's your answer right there. What's the other flesh? Another flesh. Right here, these animals listed. So, Sodom and Gomorrah did bestiality too. And the fallen angels followed the same example as Sodom and Gomorrah. So, there's your answer. The fallen angels, they did this integration. They did this, uh, these colors of the rainbow that modern society is promoting. See, nothing changed throughout our history. Nothing changed. Everything's the same. As humanism progresses, spirituality decreases. Amen. Humanism progresses, sin progresses as well. Amen. So you invite all kinds of sins going on. So that's what's going on. It's a big fat mess, and Genesis 6 was basically repeating the year 2020. Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Makes you disgusted, right? It makes you realize why it's important to attend a Bible-believing church, right? This history is important. That way you can be more careful who you hang around with, how you behave, how you act, and what you believe in. You don't want to get brainwashed by the society. This is repeating 2020, Genesis chapter 6. Now look at this, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Why is he so wicked? And that every imagination, did you read that? Imagination, imagination. Yeah, there was a lot of imagination going on. Like the year 2020, creativity, uniqueness. Why? Because they want to keep imagining things. And that's how you progress. Genesis 5 showed you the progression. So they did a lot of imagination here. But notice that with the, in, in imagination of mankind, it will always accompany sin. Look at verse 5, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was what? Only evil continually. That's how God sees it as. That's why verse 7, and the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. But not just man he destroys. Both what? Man and beast. There's something that happened with the animals. There's no doubt. Scripture with Scripture shows that. And of the, uh, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. For it repented me that I have what? Look at that. It repented me that I have made them. It's not just man. It repents God that he created all these creatures too. That's good. See? So there's no doubt that there was be uh, bestiality going on. So when you get these weird cult pastors coming out who has less than uh, 20 pastors and they keep losing pastors and churches that says the fairy tale of the Nephilim, uh, you can unsubscribe from their channel. They don't know what they're talking Novice. about. These guys are novices. These guys are novices. They don't know what they're talking about. All right. They think that they can teach Genesis and then they give, uh, ex they give chapter by chapter teachings on Genesis and then they try to attack the Genesis gap. They try to attack this thing concerning the Nephilim and Satan, how he's trying to infect mankind's seed. I mean, why, why, why would they want to get rid of that? Yeah. What spirit would want you to cover those things up? Uh. People, a lot of people don't think that these doctrines are a big deal, but you know, now that you think about it, when you reflect your history, this might be more of a big deal than you think. Yeah. The Genesis gap shows what? The history. 
history of what Satan and his beings were doing. Genesis 3, Satan, you know, he wants to attack the seed of the woman, produce his own seed as well. See, that's his demonic activity. He wants that covered up too. He wants to cover up Genesis 6 where they were intermingling. Okay, let's look back at Genesis chapter 6. But then there was one person, verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. There was one man who was clean, and that was Noah. So we see a great example of repeating, repeating history. You might say, really? Yeah. So Noah, notice right here, Noah went through this mess of mankind and went through God's judgment. So he survived God's judgment. Look at Genesis chapter 5. There was another man named Enoch who escaped God's judgment. How is this repeating history? You'll notice right here it pictures a history of the Christian church who escapes God's judgment where they get rapture and then the tribulation saints, they survive and they go through God's judgment while the world is intermingling with each other and advancing their civilization. See, history doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's repeating. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. <laughs> Genesis chapter 5. Notice verse 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not. Why? Why was he no longer existing? For God took him. See, God raptured him. God raptured him. So notice right here a repetition of our history. Now, as we go back to uh, Genesis chapter 6, let me read you some interesting things here. So during this time of advancement of technology, then it would make perfect sense to answer a lot of other questions. All right? So think about it. Think about a lot of ancient structures that was very advanced with today's modern tools today. So let's take the pyramids, for example, right? When we look at these pyramids, these are ancient structures, yet with ancient tools and ancient civilization, how were they able to build such complex structures? Yeah, how about the so think about that. Not only that, think about pyramids that were discovered not just around Egypt, yeah. but then you can look at certain parts. You go to South America, and then you go to Asia. And then not only that, um, I have an article where there were scientists, Russian scientists, who actually went down That's right. uh, where the Bermuda Triangle area was, and then they found <laughs> pyramids, pyramid-like structures at, at the bottom of the ocean over there. So it's crazy. And the Bermuda Triangle is infamously known for the conspiracies of demonic activities and disappearances. So you'll notice right here that there's a connection here all of this is connected with something demonic. It's not coincidental. Not only that, let me tell you something even more wild. So when you hear about uh, flying objects, it wasn't the Wright brothers. And historians actually know that. The Wright brothers were not the first to come up with the idea. They were the first ones who actually made the airplanes in today's generation, but the idea was not foreign. It wasn't the Wright brothers. Uh, they go as far back as to uh, Leonardo, but even before that, they even go to Chinese records that talk about it. As a matter of fact, if you go to Indian records, they actually claim that during the time when the gods lived with mankind, that there were flying objects that time, actually. Yep. Amen. So let me read you some quotes here. Now, this one is from an Oxford scholar. So his book that you can look up and buy if you're very interested. It is War in Ancient India. That's the title of the book, War in Ancient India. And the scholar's name is Dick Shitar. Dick Shitar, I think. I don't know how I pronounce that right, but let me write his name down here just in case if you're curious. You only have so many hands. War in Ancient India. So if you buy that book, he gives a lot of interesting readings here concerning about uh, the flying ships of the gods that the Indians, ancient India, 
actually lived that time. This can go back as far as uh, 10,000 years ago, actually. So this, this is where one parts read. One part reads over here. An aerial car is made of light wood looking like a great bird with a durable and well-formed body having mercury inside and fire at the bottom. It has two resplendent wings and is propelled by air. It flies in the atmospheric regions for a great distance and carries several persons along with it. The inside construction resembles heaven created by Brahma himself. That's one of those Hindu Indian gods. Iron, copper, lead, and other metals are also used for these machines. Now notice the, uh, these following elements were mentioned at Genesis chapter 5 with their tools, right? All these show how far art was developed in ancient India in this direction. Such elaborate descriptions ought to meet the criticism that the Vimanas and similar aerial vehicles mentioned in ancient Indian literature should be relegated to the region of myth. Of course, that's what they do all that time. Why? Because the pagans that time and a lot of mythologies that you read, what's very interesting is that they're talking about what they share in common, which is why they're labeled myth by today's modern scholars. But what they all talk about is that they claim during that time that gods lived with men and they had advanced technology and civilization. That's what you're going to see a common root with a lot of these mythologies. Now, you've got to think about this. They don't get these ideas out of thin air. I took mythology class, even basic mythology class 101, and how they started out with mythology does not come out of thin air. It starts from a legitimate source somewhere. There's a source somewhere, and then it takes a generation and a half or two generations where it starts to transform into mythology after that. So that's very interesting. So think about this. Yes, it's mythology, but they do have a source somewhere where they get the idea. It just doesn't come out of thin air. Now, this is something very interesting. What's pretty interesting is that they seem to make a distinction with, the, with, this, with these aerial objects from the spirit flying objects of the gods. So trying to make these aerial objects more human, actually. So this is not just something spiritual. This is something physical, that means. So let me read something here. The ancient writers could certainly make a distinction between the mythical, which they designated Daiva, and the actual aerial wars designated Manusa. Some wars mentioned in ancient literature belong to the Daiva form, as distinguished from the Manusa. An example of the Daiva form is the encounter between Samha and the goddess Durga. Samha was worsted and he fell headlong to the ground. Soon he recovered and flew up again and fought desperately until at last he fell dead on the ground. Again in the famous battle between the Celestials and the Asuras elaborately described in the Harivamsa, Maya flung stones, rock and trees from above, though the main fight took place in the field below. The adoption of such tactics is also mentioned in the war between Arjuna and the Asura, Nivata Kavaka, and in that between Karna and the Raksasa, in both of which arrows, javelins, stones, and other missiles were freely showered down from the aerial regions. Now notice how advanced this sounds already. They even mentioned the word missiles over here. Now, this is so much reading, so I don't think I can read all of this. You might get bored too, so I don't think I can read all of this. This shares the same context, so I have to read it. So let me read quickly. King Satrujit was presented by a Brahmin Galava with a horse named Kuvalaya, which had the power of conveying him to any place on earth. Yeah, because remember, the gods were intermingling with animals that time, so it could be possible. If this had any basis, in fact, it must have been a flying horse. There's your Pegasus, so to speak. Oh, is that possible? Yeah, because you're intermingling with all kinds of animals, and then these animals can intermingle with all sorts of different animals as well. Because they got the God gene now. Why? Because Satan invited them that ye shall be as gods. Will you take the fruit? And if Adam and Eve were so willing to take that, how much more with their uh, generations after them? Yeah. Wow. 
All right, let's keep reading here. There are numerous references both in the Vishnu Purana and the Mahabharata uh, where Krishna is said to have navigated the air on the Garuda. So Krishna was involved in this aerial warfare as well. Thither the accounts are imaginary or they are a reference to an eagle-shaped machine flying in the air. That's why when you read Revelation 12, the Bible talks about the nation of Israel. We're given what? Two wings of an what? Eagle. Why? Because it's referring to the airplanes where Israel is going to take that. To fly away and run away from persecution of the Antichrist. Look at how all of this is lining up. All right. All right, further, the Asura, Maya by name, is said to have owned an animated golden car. Did you hear that? Wow. With four strong wheels and having a circumference of 12,000 cubits, which possessed the wonderful power of flying at will to any place. Wow. Tesla's far behind. <laughs> They're going to catch up. We're hitting there, and we are going to get there. We are. I know we are. You might say, why? Because... Those gods are going to come down at the tribulation. And with mankind progressing and advancing in technology, and technology is even faster than ever before, generation just keeps changing where it went from 10 years to 5 years, and now we're hitting like 3 years. So this is crazy fast. It was equipped with various weapons and bore huge standards. After the great victory of Rama over Lanka, Vibhizana presented him with the Paspaka Vimana, which was furnished with windows, apartments, and excellent seats. It was capable of accommodating all the Vanaras besides Rama, Sita, and Laksmana. Rama flew to his capital, Ayodhya, pointing to Sita from above the places of encampment, the town of Kiskindha and others on the way. Again, Valmiki beautifully compares the city, the city, the whole city of Ayodhya to a what? To an aerial car. Uh, you, you see the sci-fi shows and then these cartoon shows of flying cities yeah. up in the air. These video games you play. Come on now. What did God say at Genesis 6? The imagination, imagination, imagination of man. See, they are increasing. What a world we live in. All right. This is an allusion to the use of flying machines as transport apart from their use in actual warfare. Again, in the Vik Ramauravasya, okay, we are told that King Pararavas rode in an aerial car to rescue Urvasi in pursuit of the Danava who was carrying her away. Oh, wow. There's a lot. A number of aerial cars are mentioned as bearing celestial spectators. So notice right here that we see so much uh, reading concerning about these gods riding these vehicles up in the air. Now, you know what's very interesting, which will make a lot of sense when you read Genesis chapter 6. And notice Genesis chapter 6, verse 13, when you keep reading. When you read these texts, you notice that these gods and mankind, that there was warring against each other, violence against each other. You notice that, right? Now this, way, now, this is important. You might say, why is that important? That's going to be very important when you read your Bible, when you read about demonic activity, when you look at and research conspiracy theories. It's not as one clean flow as you think, and one guy controls everything. You know what it is? It is a power play. That's why you see where who's, in, who's really in charge of the group in the elite system. But then you'll read this group where they are not actually subordinate to this high-ranking elite, but they uh, try to attack this elite as well. So then it's just, it's like contradiction. So I had a very difficult time. And then when I read, when I read uh, this one book by Brotherhood of Darkness and then uh, Phelps' book, Vatican Assassins, it helped filter it out more. But what really solved it was the Bible. Amen. Because the Bible shows here that the sign of demonic activity is, is not agreement or loyalty, but it is full of fleshy selfishness and sin and betrayal. That's why Judas Iscariot, he is known as the great, he did the greatest what? Betrayal. 
and the Antichrist would represent him. You read Revelation chapter 17, these demoniac ten kings betray this other demoniac whore, Babylon the Great. That's always a sign. That's why it makes sense uh, when you read the Antichrist is having trouble with other rogue nations. And some of these rogue nations, they actually have some devils and demons supporting them. That's why when you read conspiracy theories, you see these elites attacking these other elites and that elite, that attacking this elite. Oh, what's, what's the explanation here? Well, just like the Indian mythology, these gods were fighting these gods in their aerial warfare. Why? Because Genesis 6.13 God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with what? Violence, violence through them. See, there, how is there violence unless they're attacking each other? Unless there's disagreement against each oh, other. And not only that, these gods were living with them. So it's not a one harmonized kingdom under the rule of Satan. Mm -hmm. You know what Satan's kingdom is? You need to get this in your head. It's not of harmony. Yeah. That's where you mess up in this conspiracy stuff. Mm -hmm. You harmonize everything as one clean flow. No, I see it as a lot of contradictions. You know what Satan's kingdom is? Disharmony, yeah. violence, murder, division, chaos. It's all a mess. It's all a mess. So when you read right here, notice that Genesis chapter 6, verse 13, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So notice right here, that there is violence, that there is chaos, and mankind shedding blood against each other. Now, I know some people might bring up the fact, which is a good point, where Jesus mentioned, uh, does Satan cast out Satan? Otherwise, his kingdom is divided. But the simple answer is this. We're referring to Satan's kingdom over here. What about people who want to do their own thing? And that is mankind. That's the nature of mankind. And not just the nature of mankind, that's going to be the nature as well, very possibly, with these fallen angels and gods. Why? They're going to follow what their daddy does. If daddy's so much filled with pride that I'm not going to listen to what God says, what do you think these fallen beings are going to do? They're going to, they're going to learn from their daddy. All right? Look at the example of these cult pastors online. I'm the man of God over here. And then they criticize all sorts of pastors. That way they can look like the next legend that everyone looks up to. And guess what happens to their followers? Yeah, they betray them and they start their own little cult group. That's good, Pastor. That's a good observation. That's How about that? See, you know what mankind's not doing? They're not looking at history. You guys don't learn, man. You really don't learn. You really don't know, learn. You got to learn this stuff, man. This Genesis 6 is repeti repetition of the year 2020. All right, now let's go back. Uh, over here at Genesis 6. So we see at verse 2, the sons of God saw the daughters of men. So there were many gods throughout that time. So let me read over here by Frederick Widdowson's good book, A Bible Believer Looks at World History, like I recommended you to uh, get. It wasn't mandatory, but I highly recommended you to get it. So let me read what he wrote here. The Greeks called their gods daemons. Now remember I told you about the demons? Yeah. Yeah, and Plato and others admitted that they were possessed by their own particular demon. However, they did not look at the actions of these beings as necessarily bad, but inspiring and enlightening. Remember I read that quote from one of the Greek sources before? All right. They were givers of wisdom, which we can see mirrored in Satan's statement about how the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will make one wise. If Satan did that at Genesis 3, what do you think Genesis 6, what did they do? They did the same thing. That's why they were like progressing. Let's keep reading here. Zeus, the chief of the pantheon of Greek gods, we know by the writings of the historian Herod uh, Herodias, thank you, to be the same god as Bel in Babylon or Baal in Canaan, who Jesus called Satan. Modern mythologists refer to Quetzalcoatl in Mexico and Veracaca in Peru, as well as Odin in Norse mythology, to be the same, get this, to be the same as what? Zeus. But Zeus is also in reference to who? Satan. So all these gods, name, they're from one root, you got to realize. It's actually Satan. Yep. 
Now, I'm going to show you later on that Nimrod Semiramis carried a lot of these female goddesses and male gods, but actually, these are the human representatives of all these gods, but actually, there's a chief guy that all these gods represent, and even goddesses, goddesses too. That's Satan. Mm -hmm. Let me keep reading here, okay? This is boring stuff, so let me just read more over here. Oh. <laughs> now, here are some much later myths regarding the polluting of God's creation by these alien beings. According to Greek mythology and writers such as Plutarch, the author of the biography Lives of Illustrious Men, such heroes as the Athenian Theseus were thought to be the sons of God, such as Zeus or Poseidon. Now we know from the words of Jesus and Herodias that Zeus is another name for Satan. Men of history such as Alexander the Great, the Bible's Prince of Grisha in Daniel 10.20 were said to be of his offspring by myths surrounding their births. That's the same thing with Egypt. Pharaohs, they claim to be the children of these gods and goddesses. And guess what? That's why they like to preserve that royal bloodline so there was a lot of incest going on. See, this sexual perversion is all connected to these gods. That's right. Homosexuality, bestiality. All right, let's keep reading. Um, Aphrodite, who is also known as Venus, Ishtar, Minerva, Diana, uh, Cybele, and Ashtoreth, a.k.a. in Babylon as the Holy Virgin, the Mother of God, and the Queen of Heaven in the Bible, had human lovers and offspring. Genesis 6. So notice our world history. So all these countries, South America, Asia, the Middle East, and then Europe, etc. Notice that all throughout all our world, where they get the names of these gods is rooted, all rooted. Greek mythology, Indian mythology, etc. All of that is rooted in one chapter in your Bible, wow. Genesis 6. Yeah. Wow. All right, let's keep reading over here. She is also known, now let's look at Africa and the Caribbean islands. She is also known as Erzuli in voodoo, Oshun in the Afro-Caribbean religion. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this right. Uh, Tlatzolteot in the Aztec Mexican religion, Obatala and Ani in Africa, and Kali in India. All right. You know what all these are? Okay, look at good old theosophist, one of the famous theosophist leaders, Madame Blavatsky, you know what she says? She says on page 539 in her infamous book, she says this, the celestial virgin, which thus becomes the mother of gods and devils, you know what she says? See, the celestial virgin, uh -huh. mother of gods and devils, at one and the same time, for she is the ever-loving, beneficent deity. But in antiquity and reality, Lucifer or Luciferius is the name. Lucifer is divine and terrestrial light, the Holy Ghost and Satan at one and the same time. So to notice that we're going uh, gonna to cover it later on, probably not tonight. Uh, maybe a little bit tonight, but I'm sure a lot more next week. When we cover Nimrod and Semiramis, you're going to see how Satan revived Genesis 6. Genesis 6, actually, it should have died with the flood, but it was revived somehow. So that's why these gods and goddesses that came out today who are reflecting Satan at Genesis 6, Satan is using human representatives where it's sourced from. So it's Nimrod for the male gods, all these male gods, and then Semiram is for, for all these female goddesses. But both of them are representing for this one god, Satan. He's the guy who all these gods are named after, you've got to realize. It's all Satan when you look at world history. Isn't that interesting? Amen. All right, so that's what we see going on. And then verses 14 all the way down through uh, verse 22, you'll notice right here the Lord... Uh, commanded Noah to build an ark to take care of all the animals. And again, you see uh, scientists, modern scientists, who try to attack your Bible. How are you going to fit all the animals of the world inside an ark, okay? Well, one, he didn't have an aquarium, moron, all right? <laughs> so there goes a lot, of, a lot of percentage of your animals, actually. Yeah. 
Actually, a huge number of your animals are sea life, aquatic life, actually. So there goes, so there goes one. All right, so I'm going to give you some arguments here that you're going to have to uh, keep in mind. That way it will be helpful for you in the future, okay? Because these evolutionists are going to, uh, or these modern-day scientists are going to get on you and then try to claim that um, you can't fit all the animals inside the ark. And that's such an old argument. That's such an old argument. I'm just tired of hearing it. Okay, so it's easy. One, you got to realize that it's not all the, uh, you got to cancel out a lot of the aquatic animals. Yep. So there goes your aquatic animal. Number two, you got to realize that at chapter seven, he didn't say species over here. Yep. If you look at chapter six, Verse 20, it says, of fowls after their what? Kind. kind. And of cattle after their what? Kind. kind. And of every creepy thing of the earth after his what? Kind. kind. So there's your answer. So notice right here, it's not species, it's kind. So then the scientists, they retort, what does kind mean? And then they'll literally waste one to two hours debating with creationists on what does kind mean. You know how stupid that is? Yeah. No, I'm really serious that's stupid. You might say, why? Because, here's the thing, if you want to disprove kind, then these evolutionists have to know more Bible than we do and prove that the scientific term species mean kind in the Bible. That's what they have to do. But that's not, but that's not what they're doing in debates or arguments. What they're doing in debates or arguments is trying to put the burden on creationists. What does kind mean? What does kind mean? We don't care what does kind mean. You know why? Because we do know this. We do admit with the evolutionists, yeah, you can't fit every species inside that ark. All right? So isn't it logical to think that, hey, it doesn't have to be all sorts of subspecies or species of birds, but just a bird, and it is a scientific proof which evolutionists believe because they believe in natural selection and mutation and garbage like that. So they will admit this, that these different kinds of birds, that they can, a lot of them, they can, uh, yeah, they can debris with each other, dogs with different dogs, cats with different cats. That's possible. And when they do that, what happens? Then you get a different species coming out. What a moron. What a moron, man. So we don't have to, so that's our argument. You don't have to debate two hours trying to prove that kind doesn't mean species. You don't have to do that because we already admit with them it's not species. How? You can't fit everything inside the ark. <laughs> so there's our argument over there. They have to argue and prove that kinds mean species Correct. biblically. Yeah. They, not scientifically, biblically. You notice they put the burden on you that you have to prove this scientifically, that kind means species. No, that's not the burden. The burden is the author made the word kind right over here. So you have to prove what the author was thinking when he meant kind. See? So tell the evolutionists, so uh, when's the last time you read Genesis 6? <laughs> they put the burden on you. How much science do you know, right? Yeah. But in this argument, it does not rely on science here. It's Bible. So you put the burden on them. So uh, do you know Genesis 6? Oh, yeah, about kind. Oh, do you know the other stuff about the gods mingling with humans? And they're going to look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> Amen. And you tell them, ah, oh, it shows that you weren't really reading. You were just nitpicking or you heard it through word of mouth. Mm -hmm. That's how you catch them in arguing, okay? Mm -hmm. So remember these arguments, okay? These arguments will come in handy uh, when you debate these evolutionists about Noah's Ark. It's just so silly and stupid. Okay, now in chapter 7, notice how the, uh, the Lord drowned out the whole earth. Verse 10, And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. Okay, so notice right here that the fountains of the great deep were broken up. A lot of people, what they're going to try to argue, creationists, they'll argue that to make up the water for Noah's flood. So here's another argument by evolutionists you need to keep in mind. There's not enough water that can drown out all the earth. There's not enough water in our atmosphere. Okay, the simple answer to that is this. Number one, there were, uh, there were no rain clouds during Noah's time. So it's, if you're measuring the standard of the rain, getting water uh, from the atmosphere of today, the atmosphere back then was way different, okay? 
So during that time, we don't know how much water the Lord may have put up in heaven. And it makes a lot more sense if it was a lot more watery that time. It preserved the earthly environment, which explains longevity of life with people, protection from uh, sunlight, and as well as huge sizes of animals and dragonflies that they've been discovering. Dragonflies several feet long. Why? Because of a lot of hydro inside. A second thing is, is the second thing is that we don't argue that this uh, comes from the water underneath the ground. See, that's what creationists try to argue. They try to argue what makes up the water from the sky is the water from below. But then some atheists and evolutionists, they'll argue, well, if you're going to argue that a, a huge majority of the water comes from the ground below, then it's boiling water. So that doesn't work. Now, we Bible believers, we can admit that there were fountains of the great deep broken up uh, in the sense that the fountains of the earth the ground below, that water spurted out, and that's what explains the Grand Canyon, the volcanoes, and etc. See, this is not geological formation of evolution of millions of millions of years, or billions of years. This is actually one shot of Noah's flood, bam, it can create it like this. So that explains all the other stuff. But uh, another thing is this, another thing you gotta understand is that we don't, uh, we don't argue majority of the water comes from the ground below, only some of it. The verse right here, the greater majority of the water, it says the fountains of the great, great, see that? Great, that's huge. Great what? Deep. Now, did you forget Genesis 1? See? Uh, look back at Genesis 1. Verse 2. What did you learn? Genesis 1 verse 2. And look at the law of first mention anyways, right? Amen. First time it mentions, then we can figure out what deep is. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the what? Deep. This deep was divided by what? At verse 7. God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. So I'm not going to expound this. We know what, what this water is, right? These waters were referring to this frozen deep at the edge of outer space that is between the second heaven, outer space, and the third heaven, the floor of God's throne. So see, that's where it was broken up right here. And that's where it can make a lot of sense where all this water comes from. And trust me, there's plenty of water. Oh, yeah. You know why? Because if you believe in the Genesis gap, then you can believe that. The Genesis gap talked about there was a universal flood. So you have plenty of water. See, sometimes these so-called insignificant doctrines can be a great supporter or could be more significant than you think. Amen. So that's why right doctrine is important because everything clicks. It makes sense. So remember that. All right. Now, so that explains about the part of Noah's flood. And then boo-boo to all the scholars over there and who cares what they say. So now we see how wrong that these scholars are. Now let's look at Genesis chapter, we read chapter 6, chapter 7, we're reading this part, that the fountains of the great deep were opened up, so that's where all the water came from, we know that. And then you'll notice right here at verse 21, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth. Now look at this, look what God killed, both the fowl, and of cattle, and of beasts, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land died. And every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle, and the creeping things, and the fowl of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. So notice right here that God killed everything. Why? Because there was so much corruption. All right, now... Um, so Genesis chapter 8, we know that Noah, he was living through the flood inside the ark. He built an altar to the Lord. Genesis chapter 8 verse 20. So animal sacrifices are important to God. You notice that? We saw that with Abel, right? So the history of animals, so you, you cannot forget that. This was ever since Genesis 3. God made uh, coat skins for Adam and Eve. Innocent blood is important to God. Innocent blood. Why? As a sacrifice to the Lord. 
This is a theme throughout all throughout your Bible, you'll notice. Innocent blood. From the beginning of the Old Testament to the New Testament. And that's why Satan, he wants to corrupt this. So he replaces with human sinful sacrifice. Human blood is sinful blood. It's not innocent blood, innocent lambs. So Satan corrupts it later on. And as a matter of fact, when we read later on, the children of Israel, they neglected sacrifice for hundreds of years when they were in Egypt. So God was upset, so he wanted to restore it. Okay, um, I guess I'll cover Genesis 9 next week. We're already, time's up. I already passed it. But Genesis 9 and uh, Genesis 11 will be very important because that's where we're going to talk about a uh, culturally, culturally sensitive topic, but it's combined with something very important that has to do with the New World Order system. So this is what's going to be very important, where God, believe it or not, God originally, what he planned to do is that he knows mankind when they're all together, like Genesis 6, they mess up and then they mess around with the gods. So what God wanted to do was scatter and divide them and spread them throughout the world. But mankind didn't do that. What did they do? They want to integrate with each other. So because they want to integrate with each other, uh, Nimrod was able to form something. So then God had to force the division of races by messing up their language at the Tower of Babel. Also, you'll see this division of the nationality and races when God put the curse on Ham and then put a separate uh, ordeal for Japheth and for Shem. See, all this was ordained for a reason because God knows what mankind is capable of. And then you'll see what Satan did with Ham to start something, and then he did it with Nimrod. And then the Lord, he scattered them out. But then Satan tried to revive it again by Nimrod's cleverness of using idolatry. That way, no matter which nation you're segregated, divided, or scattered, they will all carry Satan's root religion in some way or form. That's why Acts chapter 17, God originally, he divided, put boundaries on different nations. Why? so that they might happily seek after God. That's why God judged them by their own conscience at Romans 2. So that way they can find God to the best way that they could. But, when man, but did you notice why we're hitting Genesis 6? One of the earliest reasons is because mankind tried to get together again. Yep. Did you notice that? That's undeniable in your history. You notice when mankind tried to come together again, this is where... This started coming out, this, 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 and this, and then this. Wow. You notice that? See? All right, so next week we're going to cover the sensitive topic, but also a very eye-opening topic, which will be very helpful to understand. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. God, my Father, I pray tonight's teachings were a blessing to the hearers. Dismiss us now with your blessing. I pray that you'll please bless the next Bible studies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.